Hey everyone, uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jim Ryan. I am the Director of Research and Director of the Middle East Program at uh, the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, we're coming to you uh, live from the William & Mary DC Center. Uh, and this is our event uh, that we have put together on the future of resistance in Afghanistan, uh, a moderated conversation uh, with Ali Nazari, uh, the Head of Foreign Relations for the National Resistance Front uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, the, this event is, uh, for those of you here joining us in person, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's great to be doing things in person again. Uh, we're also joined by, uh, I think, you know, several dozen people on Zoom, which is great to see. Um, I just wanna make a couple programming notes and then I'm gonna turn things over to uh, our, one, my co-moderator, uh, Phil Wasilewski, to introduce, introduce our speaker. We're gonna have a moderated conversation for about 45 minutes to an hour and then opening, open things up for uh, questions and answers uh, from the audience. Um, before we get started, I wanna extend uh, a big thank you to the William & Mary DC Center, uh, Roxanne and Kenzie, uh, who have done a really great job helping us set this up. Uh, this is our first time in this beautiful space. And uh, you know we're really thankful for their efforts, for the snacks that you guys uh, took advantage of outside. And uh, hopefully we get to do something again uh, here before too long. Um, I do uh, want to also thank uh, the, our board members, supporters, sponsors uh, at FPRI. Uh, we can't do any of this without their support. And uh, if you at home uh, are watching on Zoom, uh, please check the chat box for some links to, uh, you know, where you might be able to support us uh, through a small donation or to check out other uh, events that we have upcoming on Zoom. I know we have uh, an event in our Asia program coming up tomorrow that should be very interesting. Uh, and we are having a, a gala on December 6th in Philadelphia, if you're able to join us for that. Uh, it's going to be a big uh, event that we put together, the to return to our in-person uh, gala uh, that's going to feature uh, our, the Benjamin Franklin Award that we hand out every year to uh, Robert Gersoni. Uh, so please check out uh, more information for that is available on our website. And I hope you all, uh, you know, some of you at least are able to join us. Um, all right, so uh, without much further ado, I wanna uh, pass the mic uh, over to FPRI senior fellow, Templeton fellow this year, uh, Phil Wasilewski. Uh, he is a, a longtime analyst of the region, has deep experience in Afghanistan. And I'm, I'm really lucky to be, you know, here with him to conduct this interview because uh, he knows a whole lot more about the subject than I do. So uh, Phil, I'm gonna give it to you and uh, please introduce our speaker and get things started. Thank you very much, Jim. We're honored today to have as our guest for our discussion, uh, Mr. Ali Nazari, who is currently the National Resistance Front's Foreign Relations Head and Senior Advisor to the National Resistance Front's Founder and President Ahmed Massoud. Since 2014, uh, he has been actively involved in Afghanistan's politics, while at the same time serving as a board member of the director of the Masood Foundation, which is a charitable organization. Um, he's also a scholar, a historian, and researcher. Uh, Ali double majored in political science in Iranian uh, studies at UCLA, graduating cum laude in 2012. Afterwards, he attended the London School of Economics for his master's degree uh, in comparative politics nationalism and ethnic conflict in 2013. His dissertation topic for his graduate degree was the role of ethnic politics in Afghanistan from 1978 to 2001. And I believe we'll be talking more about ethnic politics in Afghanistan after 2001. So we very much uh, thank uh, Mr. Uh, Nazari for attending and um, we'd like to get right into our questions. So Ali, please, uh, for our audience, could you give us a brief description of the National Resistance Front, how it was founded, how it's organized, and what it's fighting for? Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Jim. Um, it's great to be here. It's truly an honor and privilege um, being here today with all of you here, people who are here through uh, Zoom. And thank you for organizing this, giving us this opportunity. Uh, to go straight into the uh, question that you just asked about the National Resistance Front. So the National Resistance Front was officially established on August 15, 2020. Um, it was a very chaotic day for everyone. 
inside Afghanistan and even outside. Um, but one decision uh, created hope for the people of Afghanistan, um, created a new narrative um, for, for the future of the country. And that was uh, um, Mr. Ahmad Masood's historic decision at Kabul airport, uh, facing pressure from all sides, um, different political figures um, from Afghanistan's political scene called him and gave him advice that he should leave the country. Same with many countries. But all along, he made a decision, no, I'm going to stay in my country. We must not uh, give up uh, our hope, our struggle for freedom, for democracy, for a better future for uh, the people of Afghanistan. So he made the decision he will stay in the country, where the helicopter went straight to Pineshare. And uh, as soon as he reached Pineshare, um, the elders, the youth, and the remnants of Afghanistan's former armed forces joined him there and they declared the national resistance fight. However, even though the NRF officially was established um, on August 15th, but we started our work much, um, uh, much uh, before that date and uh, we uh, were preparing for such a scenario uh, years before. Uh, so as soon as the uh, negotiations started in 2018. Matter of fact, there's a political organization. Yes. Uh, started by um, the Masood. Yes. Kind of an rejection of those negotiations. In fact, that yes. Afghanistan was not being invited to participate. So it started as a grassroots organization, a political organization, of course. Um, because uh, in late 2018, when the negotiations started, we knew that with such negotiations, the government will collapse. That such negotiations and at the end, an agreement between the United States and the Taliban will be catastrophic for Afghanistan. And the rest of the political elite were just ignoring this problem. They were focused on the 2019 presidential elections. So uh, as a first step, we went and approached the political elite in Kabul. But no one took interest. And then uh, Mr. Masood said, well, we, start. we have to put the elite aside and we have to go and consult um, uh, and, and, and ask what we should do from our own people. So we started traveling from village to village, um, starting with Panisha asking the people, what do you guys want for the future of Afghanistan? Do you guys want the Taliban to return? Is their vision, their system of governance something the people want, the ordinary men and women of Afghanistan want? And the answer was something else than what the media was portraying. All of them uh, gave us the advice and, and proposed that you have to prepare yourself for the future that we do not want to give up our freedom, our democracy, and we um, do not perceive the Taliban as, as a future for this country. And so on, August, on September 15th, 2019, more than 30,000 people gathered um, at the tomb of the late commander Ahmad Shah Massoud, and they declared him as the successor of his father, and um, everyone told him that it's time to prepare. The government is uh, preparing, taking measures to prevent a catastrophe, prevent a collapse. Um, the international community is negotiating with the Taliban, specifically the United States. And we don't want a replay of the 90s. And so from 2018 up to August 15, 2021, our efforts were mostly political. Uh, we were not a government. We were unable to prepare militarily. Um, and whatever we wanted to do militarily, we wanted to coordinate with the government. If the government was reluctant to help, um, and they were turning down any offer of assistance, um, and the people were forced to start taking measures themselves. 
And when August 15th came, as the government collapsed, like the House of Cards, uh, the remnants of Afghanistan's armed forces, people who didn't want to give up their fight against terrorism, didn't want to give up their fight for freedom and democracy, they joined us. And uh, we were able to form the National Resistance Front, which since uh, August 15th, uh, 2021, um, we've faced many difficulties, many challenges. Um, last year at this time, we were completely being ignored. Uh, we were not perceived as a serious uh, force or player inside Afghanistan, the Taliban. Were. The message that we were receiving as the Taliban is the only reality in the country. It's game over. And that uh, it's better to join them. Better to join them and gradually ask for reforms. Yet we refused to do so because we knew what uh, what happened in Afghanistan's future. We knew the direction the country was moving towards. Um, from day one, um, our warnings, even months before August 15th, when we went to France and met President Macron and other um, uh, officials that we met uh, from from the West, from the region, was that terrorism is going to return. The Taliban shouldn't be trusted. The Taliban isn't the solution for this country. And as soon as the Taliban returns to power, um, it will give legitimacy to all terrorists throughout the region and globe. It will um, embolden terrorist groups. It will give them the, um, a precedence where if they continue fighting in any part of the world, they can drag their adversary, their enemy to the negotiating table and receive as much concessions as they need. Because the Taliban showed them that that's possible. Well, let me ask you, at this point then, what are the political and military warrants of the NRF? Oh, excuse me. What are the uh, political uh, and military war aims for the NRF at this time? So the political aims of the National Resistance Front of Afghanistan is, so our vision is a democratic, decentralized republic where every single citizen, regardless of their ethnicity, of their religion, of their sect, of their gender, enjoys equal rights as citizens of that country. That's the Afghanistan that we want to achieve, uh, where everyone enjoys um, equal rights, where everyone perceives themselves in decision-making and policy-making, which this opens another question. One of the reasons why um, there were so many mistakes done in the past 20 years, why we had many flaws in the previous uh, republic was because most of the population did not see themselves in the decision making. Uh, from two, 2001 onwards, we saw a centralization of power in a country made up of ethnic minorities, a very diverse country in that part of the world. And what happened was with the constitution of 2005, all power was concentrated in one city and in the hands of one individual. And we saw how disastrous that was. And I saw that in person on, uh, on August 15th, uh, 2021. As soon as the president left the country, everything collapsed like a house of cards. And we don't want a repeat of that. Uh, the reason why there has been a vicious cycle of violence in Afghanistan in the past 50 years or 100 years or 200 years is because of the centralization. So for us, Lasting peace in Afghanistan, a democratic Afghanistan, a free Afghanistan, requires the decentralization of power. So politically, that is our aim. That for stabilization in Afghanistan, for peace in Afghanistan, we have to achieve this. Militarily, uh, we have short-term and long-term um, uh, aims and objectives. Uh, which I can go more in detail. Um, you know, we have few phases in the uh, military struggle that we have at the moment. Um, unfortunately, because of the 
limitations that we face with resources last year. Um, so from August 15th up to September 15th, we were fighting a conventional war against the Taliban. Yet since we were isolated, uh, since we were ignored, and everyone wanted to avoid us and believes that the Taliban is the new Afghanistan, uh, we had to change uh, our strategy. And so instead of the strategy that we pursued in the 1990s, we pursued, change our strategy to pursue a strategy that we pursued in the 1980s against the Soviets, which was unconventional warfare, guerrilla warfare. So after um, the second week of September, we started withdrawing, withdrawing to the remote valleys, the Hindu Kush, both in Pineshire and Andhra Valley. Um, last year at this time, uh, it was very difficult for us. We were on survival mode. We did not know if we will uh, survive in the winter months. Uh, um, it was our first year. Um, yet uh, we were successful, not only sustaining our forces, but during the winter, we were able to expand. Um, and right now we're in the phase one of our military operations. And phase one is pursuing unconventional tactics against the enemy, so guerrilla warfare again, to exhaust the enemy as much as possible, to gather and garner as much resources as we can, and to prepare for ourselves for phase two, which is liberating and sustaining control over actual districts and provinces. In the past year, we've been able to achieve all these aims in the past, uh, in, in phase one, except for one, the last one. We were able to exhaust the uh, enemy and the results that we received was beyond expectation. We did not expect the results of the past fighting season to be this much. Uh, the Taliban ran out of options for a counteroffensive. They launched one counteroffensive after another, but failed every time. They sent different types of commanders, capable commanders to the north, uh, to Pangshir, to Andorov, to different areas, but they failed to do any. Uh, their last option was appointing a well-known commander. His name was Zakir Kayum. He was appointed in, in late August. And they were very confident that he would suppress the resistance. Uh, so he went to Pineshire and in mid-September, uh, he was severely injured. And when he uh, and died later on. Uh, and, and during battle, his deputy was killed and many other officials that they had. So it wasn't a successful year for them. Um, when it came to their narrative, um, at first they were denying there was a resistance denying that there is fighting going on. It has everyday paths. People started questioning them. The media started questioning them. Many countries started questioning them. Uh, when there were uh, bodies being sent to Helmand and Kandahar, people started questioning them. Well, if there's peace, if there's stability in this country now, after August 15th, then where is this war happening? Why are our sons, our children, our family members being killed? Where are they being killed? So there were even from their own base, such questions were being asked. And at the same time, the resistance has started their disintegration, their fracture. Last year, all Taliban factions participated in the operation against Venture. This year, many of them didn't. They stayed away, especially the factions in the north. Uh, so we were able to exhaust them as much as possible. Two, we have been able to gather resources, even, there, even though it's a limited amount of resources, it's not enough, but we have increased our ability to uh, gather resources and to expand, to recruit more people. Last year at this time, we were only present in one province, which, which was Pancher, and one valley in an adjacent province, which is called Andhra. Today, we're present in 12 provinces, not only in Northern Afghanistan, we're actively fighting in six provinces on a weekly basis. We were able to challenge them even in Eastern Afghanistan. 
There has been numerous operations in Nangarhar, for example. Two districts were liberated in Nuristan, Mandul and Dua, and they're still not present there. They haven't returned. In the first week of October, uh, we were able to liberate a district in northern Badakhshan, Shekai district. Uh, we went in, uh, our forces went in, uh, and they liberated the district, uh, captured the district governor, the police chief. We recorded a statement from the, those officials acknowledging that the district has been liberated, kept the district for 24 hours, and then withdrew. The reason why we didn't sustain control is because we're not in phase two at the moment. We don't have enough resources to be able to contain and to sustain control over whole districts and provinces. Yet we were able to show something within a year that took the Taliban 15 years, which was liberating. For us, liberating districts, they captured districts. So that shows the determination, the will, and the capabilities of our fighters. The National Resistance Front, um, to and with, with the uh, military part of your question, our military wing is exclusively made up of the former a &E SM. The, these are forces who were trained, funded, and advised by the United States and other NATO countries in the past 20 years. Unfortunately, there is a narrative that is being promoted in many places that the ANDSF lacked the will to fight against the Taliban. That they didn't have the ability. That it was because of them that the Republic collapsed. We see something else today. We see a determination within these forces who fought for 20 years. And after August 15th, they continued fighting. Many of them didn't abandon their positions. And they're continuing to fight. And those who because of the pressure, because of many reasons, they had to return to their villages and cities and homes. They're returning. And they want to continue the struggle that they uh, um, sacrificed so much in the past 20 years. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question about the NRF's foreign relations, since you're the foreign relations head. <laughs> I seem like the guy to ask. So if you could. First, tell us on sort of a broad base, what has your outreach been to embassies, uh, you know, sort of worldwide? What is your sort of read on the temperature that you're getting uh, from the international community, uh, from the UN? Um, but then more specifically, I'm, I'm really curious about what the NRF's relations are with regional powers, particularly in the Middle East. I, if I, you know, was... I, particularly have in mind the sort of gist of Biden's national security strategy that was recently released, uh, which seems to de-emphasize American presence, seems to emphasize uh, Gulf leaders, you know, I'm reading between the lines here a bit, uh, and sort of underwriting regional order in the Middle East. Um, have, have you guys made outreach to Gulf monarchies, to other states in the region, and what, what, is, what has that reception been like? To get into um, the efforts that uh, myself and my team has been uh, pursuing for the past year. Um, so um, the NRF inside Afghanistan is pursuing military resistance, yet outside of Afghanistan uh, for the past year, we've been pursuing political resistance. And it's challenging the Taliban wherever they're present, wherever they're promoting their false narrative, wherever they're working to receive legitimacy and recognition, whether it's in individual countries or in international organizations like the United Nations. Unfortunately, in the beginning, we were facing um, many challenges and difficulties. Uh, we were not perceived as a, as a serious actor. Uh, we were being ignored. We were basically being, um, being seen as a spoiler. Um, that um, the international community and the regional countries have made up their mind that the Taliban is the solution for Afghanistan and they can contain terrorism, they can bring stability. And this Taliban, this version of Taliban, 
is a change Taliban, they're moderates, they will include everyone, they will create an inclusive government, government will eventually they will create an inclusive government. That's what they said last year. Um, but we would challenge that, uh, all of these narratives. Um, and so uh, after August 15th, um, I left the country. Um, the leader of the NRF, Mr. Masu, told me to leave and to pursue um, political resistance outside, diplomatically. And so I, I came to Washington, I went to different European capitals, I went to many uh, countries in, in the region advocating for this. That the, game, the, that, that the game isn't over in Afghanistan, that the world should not lose hope when it comes to Afghanistan, and that the people of Afghanistan still need time. This group, this terrorist group that has hijacked the country, they're not the right individuals to create a government that can represent Afghanistan. They do not represent the vast majority of the country. And most surveys that were taken in the past 20 years, only 12%, 12 to 15% of the country expressed their support for the Taliban, a very small minority. And so our messaging was that this isn't the right time to recognize a terrorist group as Afghanistan's government. We should wait. We'll wait and see if they're going to change, because if from the beginning we said they're not going to fill their promises. They're not to be trusted. Wherever I went, whether it was in the media, whether it was in private meetings, that's what I, I kept warning them. There was a lot of hope that they would change. Yet as time passed, we saw that our messaging was the right messaging, it was accurate messaging, that the Taliban did not change politically, that they want dominance. They want others to join them, but to serve as tokens. Two, they are not going to sever their ties with terrorism, with extremism. They are not going to grant rights for all citizens, especially women. And so such, such a group doesn't deserve any type of recognition and any type of legitimacy. Last year, no one wanted to listen to us. This year, it's different. Because this year, we have the credibility. What we were saying came true. Now, politically, uh, we're being heard. Uh, we are being, being given space to politically engage with different um, actors, with um, political figures, political parties from Afghanistan, with different countries, with different international organizations. And the world and many regional countries have realized that it's time for change. It's time to think of an alternative. When it came to the types of countries um, that we engage with, we send our messages to all countries, even in Pakistan. <laughs> Historically, is the founder of the Taliban and has some sponsored them for decades. We even sent them our messages. Um, and so we did not stop when it came to uh, messaging, but our actual messaging and our actual engagement happened with those that we perceive as our allies, people who we've been fighting against common enemies for the past 40, 50 years. Um, who we fought against terrorism in the past 20 years. Um, and that uh, once again, uh, we need the free world, the democratic, democratic countries and forces throughout the world to stand united because the fight for democracy is still continuing in Afghanistan. And if we lose the democratic world, then it will not only hurt the uh, credibility of democracy in Afghanistan, but in many other democratizing countries, developing countries that are trying to uh, pursue democracy. So uh, when it comes to uh, our efforts uh, diplomatically and um, uh, outside of Afghanistan, um, it has been highly successful. Uh, we have been able to convince many um, 
two months ago, we had a very good conference in Vienna. And the first conference of um, the opposition of the Taliban after August 2021. Um, many political figures and political parties from across Afghanistan's political spectrum gathered together with the support of the international community. And the joint statement was released on the third day of the conference. Uh, resistance was endorsed. Um, and the idea that Afghanistan needs a political consensus outside of the country and a political alternative was discussed. Actually, that's a great segue to my next question. Thank you very much. I'd like to talk a little bit about the not international, but intra Afghan relations and started off with political. Um, the meeting in Vienna was this with the Supreme Council of the National Resistance to Save Afghanistan that started in uh, in May of this year in Ankara, which had the uh, number of the uh, political leaders uh, from political parties uh, throughout Afghanistan. So politically, the NRF is pr pursuing a different um, approach and strategy than the Taliban. We're not working or we're not pursuing political dominance. That's not what we want in the future. We don't want to be the only player when Afghanistan is liberated. As I said before, Afghanistan is a very diverse country. It's made up of different types of people, different ethnic groups, different sectarian groups, different ideologies. And so the NRF is just one part of Afghanistan's future. But we need a political consensus to create that political alternative. So for the past six months, besides the spring and summer offensive, the successful offensive that we had in the past six, seven months, we've been pursuing political consensus. So the first initiative that we had was gathering the traditional leaders and traditional political parties that are in exile, most of them residing in Turkey. And so the representatives of the NRF went to Turkey and we were able to bring those traditional uh, power brokers together. And the National Resistance Council for the Salvation of Afghanistan was formed, a coalition. Yet that's not enough. That's just one part of Afghanistan's reality. The traditional leaders, the traditional parties. The other side is the generation that grew up in the past 20 years. The progressive generation. And so this was the purpose of the Vienna Conference, bringing those together that was outside the coalition that was formed in Turkey. So you had technocrats, you had bureaucrats, you had youth, journalists, civil rights activists, women, you had people from different ethnic groups gather in Vienna. So we're trying to bring as much political forces together as possible. And so far, we were very successful. And the reason is our leader, Mr. Ahmad Masood, is highly charismatic. Um, his approach um, has allowed people to, um, he, he's, he's very approachable when it comes to politics. Uh, he's someone who's perceived as clean educated and young, a new face for Afghanistan. He wasn't part of the, um, uh, the corruption of the past 20 years. So he has the trust and the legitimacy within Afghanistan's population. Um, the different political parties and forces trust him because they saw how he acted before August 15. He had many opportunities to join the government to receive a ministry, to receive an amb ambassadorial role or some sort of political government. But he refused to do that because he knew that that wasn't the right path. That Afghanistan's government back then needed reform. Unfortunately, those reforms did not happen. But now he's the right face and everyone accepts that. So there is a consensus when it comes to him. And he's someone who says that Afghanistan's future 
needs everyone to be part of this. And for this reason, NRF has been very successful in bringing it everyone together. Uh, thank you. I want to move now from the talking about unified resistance politically. I want to talk about uh, about unified resistance militarily uh, in the field. You earlier were describing the classic Maoist uh, version of guerrilla warfare, the three phases. One is building up your strength. Two is seizing small regional areas. And then the third phase is a large conventional phase where the forces are strong enough to then throw out the government. Um, Right now, the uh, the National Resistance Front is considered in the field the largest of the various uh, guerrilla op operations uh, under um, fighting against the Taliban. But there are a few others, such as the Freedom Front of Afghanistan, whose military leader is former Afghan Army Chief of Staff Mohammed Yassin Zia, and the Freedom Corps led by Mohammed uh, Jahish. What is the NRF relationship with the other guerrilla fighters? And is there any attempt to unify all guerrilla forces fighting in Afghanistan? against the Taliban under the umbrella of a single military organization? So the official position of the National Resistance Front is to encourage anyone who shares our vision um, to either join the NRF or to pursue their own efforts. Um, we welcome any group, um, any individual who shares our vision, which is a democratic Afghanistan or a pluralistic Afghanistan, um, to join this to resistance. So we are not trying to monopolize resistance inside Afghanistan against the Taliban. Um, and so we've been um, open to coordination and cooperation with anyone. Uh, yet, um, uh, unfortunately, we haven't, in the areas that we operate in, we haven't seen any other operate there. Uh, so um, right now, there isn't much coordination on the ground because there isn't anyone else. Um, but we welcome anyone and any group uh, that is interested in joining resistance and who wants to pursue the liberation of the country to join efforts with the NRF. Uh, that has been something that Mr. Masood himself has said many times, and I myself and many other officials in the NRF. But our, our official line and, and stance is um, anyone who wants freedom and the liberation of the country is welcome to do so, and we're willing to help in any way we can. Okay, one more question about intra-Afghan uh, relationships. Um, at this time, there's very little signs of resistance against the Taliban in the Pashtun areas of the country. Now, if you remember in 2001, uh, there were several Pashtun leaders uh, fighting against the Taliban, including Haji Abdul Qadir, uh, General Aluddin, and of course, Hamid Karzai, who led their fellow Pashtun tribesmen against the Taliban. Are there similar anti-Taliban Pashtun leaders today? And what is what relationship does the NRF have with them? So as every day passes, there has been more um, uh, personalities from other ethnic groups join us, especially from the Pashtun communities. Um, unfortunately, there has been many atrocities that have happened to uh, some Pashtun tribes, many Pashtun tribes in the south and in the east. Um, many tribes who were um, allied with the previous republic have been targeted in the south, one of them being the Achikzai tribe. Um, and the NRF is in touch with many of these groups. As I stated before, uh, we've had many operations in uh, Pashtun-dominated provinces, one of them being Nangarha. Uh, so there are some pockets within the East already pursuing resistance. It's going to take time, as it did in the, in, back in the 1990s, uh, for a more large-scale resistance to form in the South and the East. Yet, there is more Pashtuns joining our cause as every day passes. Uh, in Vienna, we had many prominent Pashtun leaders who came. Uh, Mr. Nabil being one of them, the former head of the NDS, um, as well, and, and many others as well. Uh, and in the coalition in Turkey as well, there's many 
Pashtuns uh, who are part of that coalition. Um, and so uh, right now, um, uh, there there is basically people from all ethnic groups that are supporting the resistance um, and who believe that uh, the Taliban are not sincere, um, that the Taliban are not going to eventually form an inclusive government, that the opportunity that they had in the past year, they've lost that opportunity. And basically, as every day passes, um, it's uh, making more sense that from the beginning, the Taliban never had that intention. Many people who um, encouraged us not to fight, not to resist, um, told us that the Taliban have changed this time around. Um, many of them who stayed in Kabul. Yet even those people are, are now giving us a different uh, different uh, message. They're recommending that we continue our efforts. Yes, one of the changes I remember people talking about is the Taliban would never again let the Al-Qaeda back into Afghanistan, which we saw was probably not the case when the Al-Qaeda leader was killed in downtown Kabul in a better um, apartment than I had when I lived in Kabul. I'll turn this back to Jim. Uh, Ali, let, let me actually ask you, sort of going back to your grassroots strategy uh, within Afghanistan, I think a lot of people outside of Afghanistan might, uh, you know, hear you describe grassroots politics or a progressive generation and think of something like that as actually quite novel for Afghanistan. And I'm curious whether that is true and what what is in your mind the the historical tradition of this kind of politics in afghanistan and how do you see your movement fitting into that what, what is recognizable to ordinary afghanistans about this form of politics that might sort of suggest that there's um you know better prospects uh you know for that form of politics in the future well, we don't believe this is novel. Um, the late commander Ahmad Shah Massoud also pursued a similar political strategy. Uh, his movement was also grassroots. It started from the lowest segment of the population, lowest level of the population, and went upwards um, in, in the 1970s and early 1980s. And so what we're pursuing um, is very akin and similar to what he pursued. And he was highly successful. Uh, he was able to create a very capable, competent force, political and military, with nothing back in the 1980s, receiving a small percentage of what was being given to the uh, former Mujahideen. But because of this approach that he pursued, he was able to create a vast organization that survived for many decades. Uh, so what we've been pursuing, which is a bit different than what he pursued, but when it comes to the core, it's basically the same. Um, and this is the strategy that works for Afghanistan. It's only groups like this that can uh, acquire enough legitimacy to form Afghanistan's future. And this is why Today, the people trust us, the people support us. Um, there is a clear difference. The Taliban might have geography today, control over the whole country, but they lack popular support. However, the NRF, one thing that we have is legitimacy. For example, on um, uh, September 6, 2021, um, right after the Taliban started moving into the main valley of Pineshire, um, Mr. Masood recorded a message and called upon the people to rise up to protest. And within hours, we had people in Kabul and many other cities um, go out to the streets and start their demonstrations. The same outside of Afghanistan. In every single city where we had a diaspora community, people expressed their support. So he was able to show that legitimacy within Afghanistan's population. The Taliban in the past 20 years, every year, a few times every year, they would record messages, their, their leaders, many other 
of their commanders and, and officials. Um, they would record messages calling upon the people of Afghanistan to rise up against uh, the government in Kabul and against US and NATO forces. But we never had a massive uprising inside Afghanistan in the past 20 years. Not even one part of the country. So that shows who has legitimacy and which approach works. The Taliban never have never been a grassroots organization. They have never asked the people what they want, how Afghanistan's future should look like. But they have brought in an ideology from outside, an extremist radical ideology, and have forced it upon the people. And this is why the people are distancing themselves from that. Thank you. And I mentioned the Al Qaeda presence in Afghanistan in a kind of a joking and sarcastic way, but it's a serious problem. United Nations report lists at least 21 separate international terrorist organizations that are residing right now in Afghanistan, uh, all but one, um, the Islamic State, uh, with the um, agreement of the Taliban government. And we saw this, speaking of the 90s, that in the 90s, the Al-Qaeda um, Al members, especially in subunits of it, such as the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, were used as foot soldiers in the fight against the then National Resistance Front. Today is a National Resistance Front besides its battles uh, with the Taliban. Has it forced, uh, has it been, excuse me, has it been um, in any battles with any of these international terrorist groups, such as the Islamic State, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, or any of these other groups? Thank you. Um, well, I, I was waiting for this question, <laughs> the most important question, uh, because uh, the most important um, uh, issue inside Afghanistan today is terrorism. Uh, unfortunately, after 20 years of so much sacrifice, of so much um, that has been spent inside Afghanistan, well, we have not only returned to 2001, but we're in a state and in a situation which is much worse than 2001. In 2001, there was only a few terrorist groups. You had the Taliban, and then you had Al-Qaeda and a few groups affiliated with, uh, with Al-Qaeda. Yet today, as you mentioned, there's 21 terrorist groups, international and regional terrorist groups operating throughout the country. They're stronger today. Their narrative is as, at its strongest point today. As I mentioned before, the Taliban gave them a precedence that they can challenge any country, even a military alliance like NATO for years and force them to the, uh, to the negotiating table and, and receive as much concessions as they and legitimacy and emboldened uh, uh, terrorist ideology has come into being after the signing of the Doha Agreement and especially after uh, August 15th, 2021. A few days after um, the collapse of Afghanistan's Republic, you had every single terrorist group from Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab in North Africa, to Lashkar Taiba and the others in South Asia congratulate the Taliban that they've defeated the United States, defeated NATO, defeated democracy, and so forth. And since then, we've seen in the past year, this is something that we warned before August 15th, 2021, and something that we've been warning after. August 15th, that Afghanistan under Taliban control is going to become once again a sanctuary for international terrorism and much worse than what, what existed uh, before uh, uh, November 2001. Today, the Taliban are assisting all of these groups. They are cooperating with all of these groups. They are using uh, fighters and the, all of these foreign fighters to go after us. Um, for example, and this is something that I posted in all our platforms. Um, uh, a year ago, 
after the collapse of the Republic, after the last American soldier left, a week after that, I posted a video of a group of foreign fighters speaking in Arabic, um, giving an interview and saying, we're going to Pinesher to go and kill infidels. So this was when the operation against Pinesher started. And these were fighters from the Middle East. They weren't from Afghanistan. They weren't part of the Taliban. Uh, so we've seen the role these fighter, foreign fighters are playing inside Afghanistan today. This is why we don't characterize our current struggle as a civil war. It's not a civil war. When our forces are facing Arabs, when they're facing Chechens, when they're facing Central Asians, South Asians, and others in the battlefield, how can we characterize this as a civil war? It's not a civil war. It's a continuation of the global war on terror. Yet, we were left alone to fight these terrorists with limited amount of resources. And as every day passes, this threat of terrorism is growing inside Afghanistan. What the Taliban have done is they've given these terrorist groups breathing ground. They've allowed them to set up their training centers, their training camps. Um, they have... Um, uh, they are hosting the leaders of each one of these terrorist groups. One example was Awahiri, just a kilometer away from the former presidential palace. Um, but again, with Awahiri's demise, Al-Qaeda Al isn't gone. Al-Qaeda is exper experiencing a resurgence inside Afghanistan, a revival inside Afghanistan today. They're receiving American-made equipment, American-made weapons and gear from the Taliban. The Taliban have handed over um, the control of Afghanistan's border with Central Asia to these terrorist groups. So they're actively threatening the stability of Central Asian republics. Um, they are supporting groups like Jamaat and Sarola, which uh, recently has been rebranded as the Taliban movement of Tajikistan. <laughs> Uh, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan and many other groups. Uh, they are uh, hosting the TTP, the Taliban movement of Pakistan. There's around 7,000 fighters that belong to this organization, this movement. Uh, they are um, allowing international terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and even ISIS. The whole narrative that the Taliban is against ISIS is a false narrative. This is something that we've been challenging for a year. It's not black and white. It's much more complex than that. ISIS itself is fractured in many factions. It's not only one ISIS inside Afghanistan. First, ISIS-K has been divided into a few groups. Some of the groups um, has opposed the Taliban. Some of them have cooperated with the Taliban, especially with the Haqqani now. Besides ISIS-K, in the past year, we've seen a migration of the um, actual ISIS uh, branch, which was in Iraq and Syria, um, into Afghanistan. So the ISIS that was in control of many parts of Iraq and Syria, they're moving into Afghanistan too. And basically, they have no problem with the Taliban. And the Taliban have no problem with them. Actually, the Taliban are using those ISIS members against some other ISIS factions. And there's reports that their leader might have entered Afghanistan as well, their so-called new caliph. And in many parts of the country, what we're seeing is collaboration and cooperation between ISIS and the Taliban. They're using ISIS against many forces. For example, in, uh, in June, when the only prominent Hazara within the Taliban movement, his name was Mahdi, when he defected and joined the resistance uh, and declared resistance in Balkhab district in the Northwest, the Taliban recruited ISIS members in Sarapul uh, province in the Northwest and went after Mahdi and encouraged anti-Shiite sentiment amongst, amongst those ISIS members and even their own members against Mahdi. So, what the Taliban is doing is contrary to their promises. They're allowing international terrorism and regional terrorism to become a threat to everyone. 
they made a promise that we will not allow Afghanistan to threaten any country. But that's a very vague promise. Um, they're distributing passports today. This is something that was um, verified by, we stated this from last December, January, but then it was verified by the UN Security Council in June that the Taliban are distributing passports and ID cards to these foreign fighters, to all of them. And we have evidence. But what does this mean? Are they distributing these passports so these foreign fighters could settle in Afghanistan and build new lives? No, but this is a tool that they're giving to foreign fighters so they could infiltrate into different countries as refugees, and to start threatening the stability of other countries, whether it's in the region or in the West. So I see that Afghanistan as the everyday passes is becoming um, a threat to global security. It is a threat to global security at the moment. If it's not managed, if a better counterterrorism approach and strategy is not pursued and adopted, uh, we will see this uh, become much worse in the future to manage, to subdue, to contain. Um, it's going to be much worse than we, uh, what, what the world faced in Syria and Iraq in 2014 onwards. Um, because right now, we're the last remaining democratic and anti-terrorist forces. And imagine if we're not there in five years. Who's going to support and assist the international community when everyone wakes up and realizes the problem of terrorism is not going away and it's an eminent threat to their security? There won't be any allies on the ground. There won't be any anti-terrorist forces, democratic forces to help international and international effort, like how the Kurds did in Iraq or how many other people did in Syria and Iraq after 2014. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to ask uh, maybe one or two more questions, and then we're going to turn to our audience. Uh, those of you who are on Zoom, a few of you have already done this, but if you have a question, please put it in the, the Q&A box. We want to make sure we have some, some time for our audience to ask a few questions. Um, I, I just want to ask about, I, the, we, when we spoke about this relative success of your foreign outreach earlier. Um, it did appear to me that you received a relatively warm reception in Europe and other Western countries. Uh, you know, what have relations been like with China, Iran, Moscow, regional players that have been uh, you know, pursuing greater and greater influence in Central Asia and these parts of the Middle East and you know, have a serious amount of, of capital that could be applied to whatever future Afghanistan has uh, going forward. So as I stated before, our approach is to engage with everyone, is to convey to everyone that the Taliban um, is a threat to basically uh, humanity. Um, and that as a first step, we don't we don't want to discriminate. So we we even sent our messages um, to Pakistan. Um, but uh, unfortunately, many of these countries are reluctant to realize this problem in the region. Uh, many have of them have engaged with the Taliban, have continued their engagements, are trying to use the Taliban for their own interests. Um, and that um, they see us as a threat, not the Taliban. Because many countries perceive democracy as a threat, not terrorism yet. And they see that uh, preaching freedom, preaching democracy and pursuing this is, is going to encourage others in their countries to rise up for this. So, when it comes to regional, but we have had a lot of successes um, last year. Many regional countries um, believe that um, uh, engagement with the Taliban was solely in their interest. This year, many, especially in Central Asia, um, are shifting their policy um, because, for example, Uzbekistan 
Uh, last year, Uzbekistan was mostly focused on their economic interests inside Afghanistan, building a railroad from uh, Termiz to Peshawar and facilitate tr trade to South Asia through Afghanistan. That was their priority. This year, that's not a priority anymore. Their priority is to contain terrorism because the Taliban promised them for a year that terrorism will not threaten your stability, will not threaten your country. And unfortunately, Uzbekistan has been attacked numerous times. Uzbekistan that hasn't supported us. Um, and they were distancing themselves from us in the beginning. But we saw rocket attacks on terrorists and many other acts of terrorism on Uzbekistan. And the Taliban's foot footprint can be seen in those terrorist attacks. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I, I we want to open it up to audience questions. I have a few that have come in over the Zoom, but I want to give first crack to our folks uh, here with us uh, in person. So if uh, anyone has uh, any questions that they'd like to ask uh, Mr. Nazari, please uh, raise your hand. And sure, go ahead. Oh, you know what? I don't know if this mic is going to reach all the way. I'm going to ask your question and then I'm going to have to repeat it. <laughs> I'll paraphrase that quickly for the folks on Zoom. Uh, the question is about the role of women within the NRF, given uh, that you know one of the justifications that was given for the initial invasion by the United States uh, in, in 2001, 2002, was to uh, you know, gain, garner more rights for women within Afghanistan. And now, since the last, you know, over the last year, things have appear to go back to, to square one or status quo ante. Uh, so in that light, uh, what is the role of women within the NRF? Thank you. So Afghanistan has changed society since 2001. Uh, we have seen social change um, in the past 20 years. And after August 15th, we saw um, that as we started a military resistance up north, uh, the women sto stood up against the Taliban in the cities, accepting all the risks, um, and they started um, civil resistance um, in Kabul and even in many of the villages in rural Afghanistan and outside of Afghanistan. And their act was a courageous act. And the National Resistance Front has supported them from day one. Uh, we have been in touch with many women, uh, activists inside and outside of Afghanistan. Um, the National Resistance Front has brought in many activists into its organization. Um, we have women working with us in our political committee. We have a specific committee for women. We have a, um, we have a council, which is called the Women's Council. Uh, we have women in our military committee, um, something we cannot disclose what they're doing in the military committee, but there are members in our military committee and our military council. Um, and so they're throughout our, our, our organization and all levels of our organization. But what matters isn't the presence of women in our organization, it's our vision. Because the Taliban can also bring women and show them as tokens that we have women. And they've done that many times before. So we, we don't want to deceive anyone. The thing that matters is our vision, is our objectives, is our political aims. And once again, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's an Afghanistan for everyone. It's a pluralistic Afghanistan, meaning the same opportunities that exist for men will exist for women in the future. Equality for every single citizen, whether you're a man or a woman. And this is something that we're pursuing. A, a society, a country where women will not be barred from practicing their rights as human beings. Right now, the Taliban are uh, working completely opposite of what we're seeing. Um, just recently, they banned women from uh, uh, public baths, from parks going to parks and 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 um and and basically they're trying to erase women from public life and for us 
women have an, uh, have a prominent role in Afghanistan's future. Uh, they had representation in the Vienna conference uh, more than a month ago. Um, and as every day passes, they are becoming more active um, in our efforts. All right, uh, one other question here from the audience and I'll go to some of the questions we have over Zoom, go ahead. Uh, so real quickly, the, the question is about uh, how NRF messaging projects and is mediated uh, within Afghanistan, whether by social media or by more traditional media sources. Uh, what, is the, what is the communication strategy? Uh, thank you. Uh, so we're heavily using social media, of course, because uh, traditional media, uh, mass media, has has an included Afghanistan in its media cycle for for quite a while now, and um, there is more issues to cover nowadays than Afghanistan. So we've been mostly concentrated on getting out our message through social media, different platforms, um, using different approaches and means, but uh, definitely social media has been a great tool for us getting out our message um, and to convey our uh, messages, our aims, our object objectives, and our accomplishments and achievements, uh, something that we've been unable to do in, in traditional media. Uh, I'm going to ask a question that's coming over Zoom. Uh, this is from Jason Hatch. Uh, there seemed to be some blowback for Ahmed Massoud uh, after discussions that were held with the former NSA, uh, Hamdallah Mohib. Uh, was this only a tempest in a teacup or was some sort of rift developed between uh, those two leaders? Oh, I think there is some sort of exaggeration happening with that question. <laughs> yes, um, there was a short conversation that happened um, uh, via telephone a while back a few months ago. Um, it was leaked in the media. Well, of course, that individual isn't popular uh, within Afghanistan's uh, uh, population. So there was a lot of outcry and a lot of um, neg negative reactions. But at the end of the day, that only lasted for a few days and um, it didn't have damage. Uh, I'll take maybe one more uh, here. Sorry. Uh, we have a, a question here from uh, Danny Lofton that I want to get to. Um, this is a question about the long you know, struggle of outside powers to unify and manage Afghanistan over the last century, the British and the Soviet and the Americans, the, this, the line that we get fed here uh, in the United States about Afghanistan being a graveyard for empire. And um, he's asking, uh, you know, is is it more feasible, uh, you know, or is it understood to be more feasible by folks in Afghanistan that Afghanistan is maybe better off as more than one country, as three or four countries? Or you you mentioned the decentralized uh, aim of the NRF. What does that potentially look like? Should you achieve your aims, uh, federated republic, uh, something maybe similar to Iraq or uh, some other kind of model? So when it comes to this question, we are proposing a decentralized Afghanistan. Um, and it's something novel, it's something new. It has never been tried in Afghanistan, a decentralized political system. Yet the specifics, we believe it's up to the people. Uh, we believe uh, that once the country is liberated, it shouldn't be a group that should force a specific political system on the people. They're, they should have options, they have, should have choices, and the people should, through a referendum, choose their next political system. Uh, I, I believe uh, each option and political system has its merits, um, but again, it's not up to us to decide. So for us, we promote the idea of decentralization, meaning power is decentralized, from the center to the peripheries, uh, that uh, the local gov governments and the provincial governments are empowered, but the actual system 
it should be decided by the team in the future. It's not up to us to decipher that. Actually, I'd like to ask a follow up on that because when you're talking about decentralization and you're talking about, well, the people should decide, but there's really only a couple of different options. One is you have a federation or one is you have a confederation or the other is you have two separate countries, North, the Tajiks, the Hazaras, the Turkmen, the Uzbeks, the Aymaks and the other minorities and South, the majority Pashto. Um, can you see any of those uh, options as being the future of Afghanistan? Well, when it comes to, um, to answer this question more specifically, when it comes to partition, I don't think Afghanistan has reached that stage yet because we still have so many other options. As you said, decentralization has different forms and shapes. You have federation, you have semi-federation, you have confederation, so many different systems, which we've, we haven't tried any of them. In the past 200 years, we've only tried one type of political system. Yes, it has been, what, an emirate, monarchy, uh, a, a dict dictatorial communist regime, and then back to an Islamic republic, and now, um, now well, it's in a state of anarchy. But we have only tried a unitary political system, whether it was a presidency or a monarchy meaning power has been concentrated in one city and in the hands of one individual. And this is why we've seen a vicious cycle of violence throughout Afghanistan's 200 year history, the past 200 years, um, because one individual makes decisions for everyone. And this has created the ethnic divisions, the sectarian divisions, the tribal divisions, and uh, it has been a failure. And after 2001, one of the mistakes was repeating this fail, bringing back, because the constitution of 2005 was, a, was somewhat a copy of the 1964 constitution, which was for a monarchy. And so the Republic was shaped based on that constitution. And we saw how disastrous this was. So what Afghanistan needs before reaching that option is trying a few other options. And for the people to uh, uh, settle on a new social contract on how to coexist peacefully in this country. And we don't want to pursue that last option before trying these other options. So this is why I, I don't believe this is the time for, for partition. It, it shouldn't be the option that should be up for discussion because right now, as we see, everyone is being affected in the country. And as every day passes, even the Pashtuns are realizing that the Taliban is not in their interest and they're joining the resistance or will gradually join the resistance. Uh, and uh, we should definitely try other options, especially decentralized models of governance before pursuing such a, such a radical uh, option. Thank you. Are there other questions, are there other questions in the audience? Yes. All right, well, I've, I've got more on Zoom. <laughs> uh, we have an active audience, so over over six about sixty people uh, on Zoom, which is really great. Um, so uh, obviously, th this is a, an anonymous question, but uh, you know, obviously, you've been sort of the person out in front for the NRF uh, in the media all over the world. Um, but you know, you mentioned earlier the particular charisma that Ahmed Masood has. Are there plans for him to speak in public uh, and deliver his message directly uh, in the near future? Future and uh, what shape might that take? Uh, so he has done that in the past year. Um, so in the beginning, much less, but uh, recently, much more. He has been much more out in the media, and uh, he at his first press conference in Vienna in mid-September. Uh, he has given many interviews in the past few months. Um, 
uh, since we're here in the U.S., he gave an interview with NPR and other media outlets. Uh, he has written op-eds before, his most uh, um, most read uh, op-ed was the one he wrote uh, back in uh, April 2020, and it was specifically on 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 the uh, question that you asked uh, previously on on decentralization, and he wrote that um, in the New York Times. So he's been trying to convey his message as well, um, and has been engaging with the media, engaging with uh, and and participating in such events uh, much more than before. Uh, so um, it's a bit more difficult for him compared to me since um, I, I do travel much more and um, it's easier for me to attend events like this, but uh, he's been trying to get out his message directly and to directly engage with the media. And I'm gonna maybe synthesize a few different questions here over Zoom. Uh, there's a number of questions coming from people and the sense that I get is, you know, the United States spent 20 years in Afghanistan. And as you mentioned before, many things about that struggle are back at square one. What is the timeline? I mean, are we, are, what is the time horizon for your aims for the, the, you know, the struggle as it, you know, as it continues? Is this a five-year project, a 10-year project, a 20-year project? I, I understand there might not be a very clear answer to this, but um, you know, what do you, what would you say to, you know, Americans who are like, you know, this is a 20 year investment and it's gone. Did we need to invest for 30 more, 50 more? What, what, what would, what's the response there? And I'll just add another thing because war is, you said is, is unpredictable. So we won't ask you to give a timeline, but why should Americans still care after previous 20 years of investment of blood and treasure? Well, there's different ways of answering this question. Uh, one, when it comes to our struggle, I, it's not based on timelines. Uh, we're going to continue this as long as it takes um, because we value freedom and we value justice and democracy much more than anything else. This way has been something that we've been pursuing for the past 50 years, whether it was our resistance against the Soviets or against terrorism and, and the Taliban in the 90s and in the past 20 years and now this new phase. When it comes to why our efforts matter for Americans specifically, one is uh, we saw what happened when Afghanistan was ignored last time. So in 1992, Afghanistan was ignored, was abandoned from the US government's official policy um, for a, almost a decade, up to 2001. And we saw how that impacted the United States. Well, that the situation in Afghanistan allowed groups that had animosity towards the United States that uh, uh, pursued uh, uh, terrorism and, and planned, facilitated attacks on, on Americans it was rooted in Afghanistan. And it was because the United States ignored Afghanistan for a decade. And if the same thing happens once again, the threat isn't, hasn't gone anywhere. It's much worse. It's going to be much worse. The impact and consequences for, the, for America, for the West is going to be much worse this time around. Because as I mentioned before, terrorism is much stronger. They're more capable, they're, they have more cells, um, there's more groups, uh, and their morale, motivation is much higher than before. Also, our struggle is for freedom. As for democracy, just how many other countries are struggling for democracy and freedom, and they're being supported by the international community. Um, and that the US, the American people, are part of these achievements. In the past 20 years, the investment caused social transformation inside Afghanistan, as I mentioned 
about women. Uh, and this is an achievement. And there should be an effort in sustaining these achievements and preserving these achievements. And right now, the only group doing this is the NRF. Um, and so I believe there's many reasons why Americans should stay engaged with Afghanistan. Yeah, it might be uh, thousands of miles away from, from Washington, D.C., but at the same time, it's, it's, the threat is very close. And if it's not taken care of, it's, if there isn't much more uh, attention given to Afghanistan, it's, it's going to become a much worse problem in the future. The question was about the possible infighting within the Taliban and the effect that might have on future in Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, when it comes to the situation of the Taliban, so for the past year, um, basically it has been a competition over power, over resources. Um, and so you have, we have experienced a gradual disintegration of the Taliban. The disintegration of the Taliban has already started because of these differences. Uh, you have a few factions, with different names, with different interests. Um, they're fighting for, uh, to, to acquire resources. They're uh, um, basically, there. many of them is because of their tribal differences. Uh, for example, one um, uh, rift uh, that, that has deepened in the past year is the rift between the Northern Taliban and the Southern Taliban. Last year, um, in August and September, for example, when uh, they entered Panjshir, um, basically all the factions of the Taliban in Panjshir. This year, the factions in the north, they avoided uh, facing us. And as I mentioned before, many of them have even defected to the resistance um, because they've seen corruption in Kabul and Kandahar. Uh, they've seen uh, that the uh, other Taliban factions are um, pursuing exclusionary policies. Um, and again, inside Kabul as well, they've been attacking one another. Uh, there has been targeted assassinations. How uh, many of these ISIS attacks that you've seen um, in the media, they're in reality, one Taliban faction attacking the other. Um, they've just, so they can cover their differences, their divisions, they've uh, been advertising these attacks as ISIS attacks. Um, but many of these targeted assassinations of Taliban members have been one faction going after another. Um, and as we move forward, it's going to get worse. What we see today, what we forecast is that the Taliban's disintegration has started. It's impossible for, for, for this group to control all of Afghanistan in the foreseeable future. It's a terrorist group. It's a crime syndicate. It's a drug cartel, it's not a government. It lacks discipline. Um, they're exploiting the people. And they're trying to, they're only pursuing their group or their faction's interests. And this is causing problems for them internally. Uh, and um, many times, many of these differences are now, um, are, are, are being leaked in the media and are becoming more, much more known in the public sphere. And so what's going to happen is that as we move forward, we're going to see more splits within the Taliban. Um, and this disintegration is going to cause them to lose control of the country, at least many parts of the country. Now, what will happen after that is, um, is, is uh, basically, <laughs> There's many scenarios that could uh, transpire after that. Um, one of them could be that we're ready or prepared politically and militarily to fill in that void and vacuum, but still there's many other possibilities that can happen. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to conclude at this time because we have to get our guests to the airport through the Washington rush hour traffic and the rain, which is gonna be a daunting task. But we thank you so much, Ali Barzari, for coming. We thank you so much. We also like to thank our host, the William and Mary Washington Center. And for those of you here in the audience and those of you viewing on Zoom, if you're interested in this topic um, further, 
uh, William and Mary will be hosting a virtual Zoom meeting Wednesday, November 16th. Um, Afghanistan under Taliban rule, uh, moderated by its professor, Rand, Randy Mullen. So again, check the William and Mary website for further information about this. And I'll give the last word to my colleague here, Jim Ryan. Uh, yeah, thank you, Phil, and thank you to everyone who was able to join with us. I do encourage uh, folks to check out the event that William and Mary is putting on uh, tomorrow on Zoom. Uh, Ali, thank you for joining us and uh, wishing you the best of luck. Hopefully, we can, you know, perhaps revisit this conversation in a year or so and with different prospects. Uh, and we hope to be back here uh, in DC before too long. All right, so long, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.